Uh, first of all, thanks very much to Seattle Town Hall for having me part of your your event list. It's that's a real honor to me. It means very much. And I would also like to thank WPSR for sponsoring the event as well and being part of this. Uh, I can't think of a single organization that is doing so much in so many different areas for the planet and her people. So let's give them another round of applause, please. Um, so this book and my journey of reporting on climate disruption started back in 1995. Uh, that was the first time I went to Alaska and laid eyes on Denali, and it was love at first sight, and it was like this tractor beam started and pulled me. She was like saying, come on, come on up. And, and uh, I just knew that was the place on the planet where I needed to spend a lot of time. And so a year later, I moved up to Alaska and started mountaineering. And uh, not it wasn't about conquering peaks or any of that nonsense. It was just about that was the place on the planet that for some reason I felt deeply drawn to be and spend as much time as I could. And so accompanying that was an immediate lesson in climate disruption. It was 1996, and I was going out to early season ice climbing fests outside of Anchorage, and the glacier that we were going to, the Matanuska Glacier, was receding every year further and further uh, quickly, and so they'd have to move the parking lot closer to it, uh, the dirt, you know, ex expand the dirt road in further, and then the, long, the, the, the walk would get longer again each year. Uh, pools forming on the glacier, things like this, going through Christmases in Anchorage with no snow on the ground, um, dramatic temperature shifts. Uh, so it was clear then, even though I really had very little personal politics, uh, I was a long ways off from starting to work as a journalist and certainly wasn't studying climate disruption. But it was clear, as people in Alaska know, that with the Arctic warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet, that something was amiss. So I uh, was actually working on Denali. I started just climbing it uh, individually and then working as a guide and then later working as a volunteer with the National Park Service. And it was up on top of uh, or on the heights of Denali listening to the BBC World Service in my tent at night during the Iraq invasion in 2003 that something inside of me said, you're going to need to go do something. Um, the regular activism and writing letters to senators and things like this is not getting the job done. So I felt this pull to go over to Iraq and just write about how the Iraqi people were being impacted. And so I was younger and crazier. Um, and so I just sent myself into Iraq, bought a laptop and a camera, and I started reporting from the streets. And not too long after that, found myself in Fallujah and all of a sudden I was working as a journalist. And I followed that thread uh, because it came to me from being really, really tied into a place on the planet that was really, really special to me. I see that today. And what I found though over there obviously was horrific and it was far, far worse than what most people here at the time at least understood was happening. I was reporting on atrocities being carried out by the US military, war crimes, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, who was formerly the cool head or the grown up in the room of this so-called administration, uh, watching him single-handedly uh, uh, order war crime after war crime being carried out in Fallujah. Uh, now, of course, uh, with the comfort of some time between those events and now. Uh, most of this is common knowledge and, and accepted in, in uh, mainstream society here. But what's been disturbing to me, especially working on this book, which I use the same model as my Iraq reporting, I, I sent myself out into the front lines where climate disruption is the most obvious, happening the most dramatically, the fastest, and in places that uh, a lot of the places I went to, uh, 
the, the life that I went there to write about literally will not be there within 10 years. And I wanted to go there to really bring these places to people since so many people won't get a chance to go to the Amazon or the Great Barrier Reef or a lot of these glaciers that are vanishing before our eyes and really give people a visceral experience of, of what is happening to these places. And so um, I, I came into the book, though, thinking that I write this monthly climate dispatch for Truth Out, and it's essentially a heavily scientific-based survey of the last 30 days of really deeply disturbing uh, uh, scientific studies that are being published showing how fast things are accelerating. And, and I came into this book thinking, yeah, it'll be mostly 75% science and that kind of thing because I was really angry and I, I was frustrated that people weren't really getting the magnitude of what's happening and especially getting how far along we already are. And so like the sentiment behind many of those dispatches, I was angry, and I wanted to kind of shock people awake. And, and, uh, but then I started working on the book, which entailed having a much, much deeper relationship with the planet. And instead of this, this idea in my head of it's going to be 75% science and then maybe 25% personal narrative and some nature writing, it flipped itself. And I started writing the book, and it became much more about look at this planet. Look at this planet. Really look at this planet, where we are, and look at what's happening to it, and look at how fast it's happening. And I started going out into these places and getting broken open over and over and over again, which was exactly what happened to me in Iraq, going into these places and talking with these people and these families and these kids and watching what was happening and just getting broken open over and over and over again. And... That, every chapter I wrote in this book, that was the experience. Um, uh, just like in Iraq, what happened. And so my hope tonight is I want to take you to a couple of these places and uh, do my best to bring at least a, a, a few moments of that experience to you. And, and um, because we are at a point now where we're literally in the sixth mass extinction, we're losing uh, over 100 species a day around the planet, and it's accelerating. And this is a topic, as we heard in the introduction, uh, what bigger topic is there, what more important topic is there. It affects all of us, even the people denying it. It, it affects all of us, and it's going to intensify every day for the rest of our lives, no matter what we do. And we're in it, and we're going into it together, and my hope is that if we really let this information in and get a very accurate map of what's happening, then we can come into it fully awake and understand the grieving that's going to have to happen and all the associated emotions in order to show up and go through that and then come out that, I think, a lot with a lot clearer eyes and a lot clearer heart and a lot more focused on what's really, really important and what we're going to need to do together to go through this. So, like I mentioned, the book provided me with the great privilege of going out to some of the most amazing places on the planet with incredible people who had dedicated their entire lives to studying them. And I, I made it a point to go to places, some of them I had been to 20 years before and had long-term relationships with, and if I couldn't do that, then to go to these places and be and accompany scientists who had been studying them for 20, 25, 30 years, uh, one of them longer than I'd been alive, and, and uh, talk with them about what they were seeing when they went out to, into these places. So I thought, given uh, our geography and how reliant upon glaciers we are here in the Pacific Northwest, I just live over in Port Townsend, um, I thought I would start with taking us to Glacier National Park. Um, uh, there's a man there named Dr. Dan Fagri. He's a scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and he's a research ecologist and directs the Climate Change and Mountain Ecosystems Project there. He's also, importantly, the lead investigator of the USGS Benchmark Glacier Program. 
and he's been working in the park since 1991. And the Benchmark Glacier Program is really important because glaciers really are a canary in the coal mine of climate disruption. If you want to know what's happening and how fast it's happening, just look at what's happening to the glaciers. In the Benchmark Glacier Program, they take uh, a, a specific glacier that's representative of the region where it's located. There's one in Glacier National Park. There's one in North Cascades National Park. There's one up in Alaska, and there's some others. And they've been, uh, this program has been going on for over 50 years. And they measure them every year and tabulate what's their maximum, what's their minimum, how much have they lost. And then this gives us a very, very accurate real-time uh, indicator of precisely what's happening with climate disruption. And Dr. Fagri, I met with him in his office in the west part of the park. Um, he's very excited to talk about glaciers. And uh, he had made uh, international news that summer uh, when I met with him because Montana was undergoing, uh, experiencing record heat waves, record wildfires. And the day I met with him, it was you know, in the middle of one of these heat waves a couple of summers ago. And so I'd like to read a, a brief section from my book. I'd been talking with him, and he took me out for a little ride up the going to the Sun Highway up to Logan Pass, this really stunning highway carved into a very sheer mountainside going up to the pass at about 6,000 feet. And so we get up to the top of the pass. We'd been talking all the way up in his car. I was taking notes. and. He was being kind enough to stop and let me get out and gawk and take photos of the magnificent landscape. And we get up to the top, and we, we park, and we walk up to uh, an area where there used to be a glacier. And so that's the setting for this conversation, where he says, talking about what's happening, this is an explosion, a nuclear explosion of geologic change. He's just, he says this, describing the impact of climate disruption while we looked out across the valley together. This is unusual, it is incredibly rapid, and exceeds the ability for normal adaptation. We've shoved it into overdrive and taken our hands off the wheel. He takes me to stand in another area of slush. The people who built the Logan Pass Road had to deal with a glacier here, right here, he says, pointing down to our feet. Now, there is no glacier. To underscore his point, Vagri tells me that this year, they had 137% of the normal snowpack and two days earlier, it was already below normal for the year, for this time of year, because of the heat. We had a snowfall up here recently that needed to be plowed, he says, smiling, and it melted before they could plow it. I asked him if that kind of thing is what keeps him up at night. He tells me these are nonlinear changes that aren't based on a simple proportional relationship between cause and effect. They are usually abrupt, unexpected, and challenging to predict. The aggregate of multiple nonlinear changes is enormous in orders of magnitude, and that's what keeps Dan Fagery worried at nights, he says. After a pause to let all that sink in, Fagery goes on to explain that the Earth has a resilient system that has been through much worse than what we've caused, ice ages, volcanism, etc. So many of these things will recover, he says, of the glaciers and forests that are vanishing before our eyes but not in the time frame that includes humans. We returned to the car and continued driving down the other side of the pass. We roll down our windows, and neither one of us talks for a while. I know it's a sensitive topic to bring up with scientists, and most of them avoid it at all costs, but I decide to ask him what it is like for him, especially to watch the glaciers vanish before his eyes. It's like being a battle-hardened soldier, he says, but on a philosophical basis, it's tough to watch the thing you study disappear. I watch him drive for a couple of silent moments, then I look out across the valley and listen to the waterfalls as they stream down toward the river far below us. Glacier National Park, around the time it was being considered to be made a national park, there were 150 glaciers that covered roughly 150 square kilometers of area. Today, they're down to 26 glaciers, and they cover less than 20 square kilometers of area. Um, the definition of a glacier changes depending on what region it's in. In Glacier National Park, it has to cover a certain amount of uh, square kilometers, and it has to move. Those are the two criteria. By those criteria, Fagri 
uh, he made headlines that summer when he announced that there will be no more glaciers in Glacier National Park by 2030. So that's less than 11 years from now. He also, I quote him in the book saying this, and I cite the studies that back it up. Uh, we are on a trajectory to have no more glaciers in the contiguous 48 United States by 2100. So if we think about, there's two aspects of that that I want to cover. One, for us, it's obvious. Here in the Northwest, it's, it's easy with this audience. Uh, we understand what glaciers mean for our groundwater, for drinking water, and for irrigation for growing crops. Uh, without glaciers, uh, much of that goes away. I mean, when 2015, when Jay Inslee declared statewide drought on May 15 of that year, in the Olympics, we had 6% of our snowpack. Farmers on the peninsula were suffering. They were water rationing in Port Townsend. Uh, we had wildfires in the rainforest of Western Olympic uh, National Park. So imagine if there's no glaciers, what this means. Uh, bigger scale, the Hindu Kush region of the Himalaya, another study came out uh, recently. It was actually an update on one that I had, I had uh, early, a previous study I'd cited in the book. This is a region where seven of Asia's major rivers, uh, it's their headwaters because it's one of the largest ice sheets in the world outside of the poles. And those, that ice, it, it current trajectories, uh, up to 99% of it will be gone by 2100. And, and 1 1.5 billion people rely on those waters for drinking water and irrigation. So extrapolate. You have to think about it for about 15 seconds. Where do those people go? And then what happens to the areas where they go? And where, where does all that water and food come from? So you can see where this is going. Um, it's, I could talk the rest, spend the rest of the talk just talking about what, you know, some of the human ramifications when we kind of extrapolate and play those scenarios out. But another one that I think doesn't get talked about enough, and I wasn't aware of it until I hung out with Dr. Fagri and some of the USGS scientists I went out with on glaciers up in Alaska, it, it's the ecological impacts. So um, some broad brush strokes, if you have a glacier in a valley, that the streams coming out of that obviously are gonna be cold. The temperature, the ambient temperature of the valley is gonna be kept down because of the glacier. And there's gonna be certain fish and, and, and not mosquitoes, but in, other insects in, in the runoff streams from those glaciers. And as those glaciers go away, then the fish and the insects that live in those streams are going to go away, as are all the animals that rely upon those. The groundwater is going to change. So certain trees that are there, other kinds of vegetation, and then everything living in those and everything dependent upon the things that are living in those, all of that's going to change and much of it's going to go away. So there's tremendous ecological impacts to all the other species as well when glaciers go away. It's not just this thing that's gonna affect humans, and it's not just this aesthetic thing, oh, there's no more beautiful glaciers on Mount Rainier to look at, but, but lots of other species are going to be gone uh, when we lose glaciers, not if, but when. The next place that I would like to take you is the Amazon, briefly. Uh, I was really tremendously lucky to get to go there. And uh, some brief uh, uh, statistics, many of you probably know some of this, but just for context, it's the lo single largest rainforest on the planet. It's two thirds the size of the contiguous United States, the Amazon basin. It generates half of its own rainfall and contains 20% of the world's rivers. The Amazon River alone has 1,100 tributaries, 17 of them longer than 1,000 miles each. There's thousands of species of trees, 2.5 million species of insects, thousands of species of birds, and 3,000 species of fish in the Rio Negro alone. Uh, I spoke with one scientist who was part of an expedition. It was uh, 25 scientists, they went out for 30 days to a remote region of the Amazon, and in that one expedition alone, they discovered more than 80 new species. Fish, insects, birds, frogs, etc. 
on average, a species is to this day being discovered in the Amazon at least every two days. The average is actually a little bit more than that. So we know a lot about it. We know enough about it to know how much we don't know about it. So I was privileged to get to go there with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. He's also referred to often as the godfather of biodiversity. He has been studying the Amazon since 1965. He was head of the World Wildlife Fund for 14 years. He was a White House Science Council, and his resume, it would, it would take you a little time to read his full resume. He's a, a leading expert on biodiversity uh, in, in, on the planet. So we met up with Dr. Lovejoy in Manaus, a big city of about two and a half million people in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon, piled into Jeeps, took a very long, windy, bumpy, hot Jeep ride deep into the jungle, and then we arrived at this little trailhead, and he hopped out, grabbed his backpack, and hightailed down this trail. Uh, the rest of us get out, you know, kind of slowly stretch and grab our backpacks and started hiking down this trail. And he's down there meeting us, this esteemed scientist who was actually quite quiet and, and very, very humble. And he went down there quickly so that he could greet each one of us and shake our hand and look in our eye and thank us for taking the time out of our busy schedules to come visit his camp. Um, that's the kind of person he is. And that's why he's dedicated his whole life to studying this area that he cares so much about. So you get into the camp. It's Camp 41. It's the most famous of several other camps that are set up to study these different fragments of the rainforest. And there's no walls. Uh, over on one side of the camp, there's a big tin roof with hammocks strung up. And so you go grab your hammock. They have mosquito netting over them, and you throw your backpack there. And then in another area, there's some picnic tables in a kitchen. And then over on the other side of camp is where the scientists are, are camped out in their, their hammocks. And for anyone who hasn't been to the Amazon, it's, and this was my first and only time to go there, it was a really, really remarkable experience. I mean, you can read about it and see photo books and watch documentaries. But to go there was an entirely different experience. Um, I mean, it was obvious to me from the first night that something was happening that it literally came into my dreams. I started literally having dreams the first night about the jungle. It was as though I could like feel myself being pulled into it. Um, some of the dreams really shook me up. Others were quite enlightening. And then we would wake up in the mornings with the roar of troops of howler monkeys drifting through camp, uh, bird song coming at first light. And then getting to go out on these walks in the jungle with these experts learning about vines and trees and insects. And then as the longer we stayed there, this group of us, this kind of disparate group from around the world, people from all kinds of different countries speaking different languages. But even just after a couple of days, we found ourselves acting like a family, just really coming together, sharing meals, really curious about each other, kind of stories feeding off each other and really coming together as a group. And, and the same experience with all these different scientists also from around the world. And, and, and when I was there, it was obvious, like this is the jungle, this is what it does. It's just like pure life force that was just like pulling us all into it and together, you know, all one thing. And that was, that was you know, that's really the best way I can describe that experience and it was truly remarkable. And so one of the scientists that I met there, his name's Vitek Jirinek. He's from the Czech Republic, and he'd worked at the time in at least 11 different wildlife research positions around the globe. And he was there currently getting his PhD in ornithology from Louisiana State University. And he had admired Dr. Lovejoy since he was a kid, reading Song of the Dodo, and uh, it was his dream there then to be studying at Camp 41 and at times literally working alongside Dr. Lovejoy, and he was very excited talking about that and talking about some of the things he was studying, uh, but I want to read a, a brief bit from one of our conversations once we started talking about uh, the impacts of climate disruption and what he was seeing. He assumes a somber tone when we talk about his research. Quote, island biogeography is no longer 
an offshore enterprise. It has come to the mainland. It's everywhere. The problems of animal and plant populations left marooned within various fragments under circumstances that are untenable for the long term has begun showing up all over the land surface of the planet. The familiar questions arise. How many mountain gorillas inhabit the forested slopes of the Virunga volcanoes along the shared boundaries of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda? How many tigers live in the Sariska Tiger Reserve north of northwestern India? How many are left? How long can they survive? Now there is anger in his voice. How many grizzly bears occupy the North Cascades ecosystem, a discrete patch of mountain forest along the northern border of the state of Washington? Not enough. How many European brown bears are there in Italy's Abruzzo National Park? Not enough. How many Florida panthers in Big Cypress Swamp? Not enough. How many Asiatic lions in the forest of Gur? Not enough. How many Indri in the Alamazodra? Not enough. And so on. The world is broken into pieces now. Just before going to Camp 41, as I'd mentioned, we were in Manaus. And it was there I met another amazing scientist uh, who also had been working with Dr. Lovejoy for a long time. And she, of all the scientists that I interviewed in, for and in the book, definitely has the best name, particularly given her study. Her name's Dr. Rita Mesquita. <laughs> She's a biologist and researcher with the largest research institute in the Amazon. And so she, when she was in Manaus, she worked, there was a forest fragment right inside the city with nature paths through it, and she would take people through it on educational walks very excited, you know, rattling off all kinds of statistics about species and their habits and all these things. Um, and again, kind of like the experience with VTech, um, you know, it was amazing to see her very bubbly and excited and, and just information just flowing out of her like a river. Uh, but then after walking out and looking at the jungle and being educated by her, she took us into a back room and sat down and we had a serious one-on-one -on -one interview. And I'd like to um, read you uh, part of that. She explained why it's so important to take care of the Amazon basin. It is the pump, the heart of the world, she says. All the major air flows come through here. Air travels all the way from Europe and Africa and converges as it enters the central Amazon. But she sees the world questioning conservation and jeopardizing all the victories that have been achieved in setting aside land. I work hard for conservation, she says, but I lose sleep over wondering if I'm wasting my life. Am I wasting my life? Is this a lost cause? I keep doing it because it's the only thing I know to do. She says she doesn't believe she and her colleagues are doing their jobs with the urgency needed. We're not telling the general public what is really going on, she says. Having co-edited a book with Lovejoy and authored many peer-reviewed scientific papers, Mesquita is a force to be reckoned with, but she personally feels inadequate when looking at the bigger picture. It is clear to her that we are nowhere near where we need to be. I have zero pride in all my papers because we are preaching to the converted, she says. What I want to do is talk to the outside world. I want to be able to just talk to people and tell them what is actually happening. We need to educate people about what is really going on with climate disruption. Like so many of the experts I've spoken with for this book, Mosquito believes the root cause of climate disruption is humanity's lack of connection to the planet. Even here in Manaus, kids don't understand that they live in the Amazon, she says. So there is no connection at all with anything, and that is the problem. There is sadness in her voice as she tells me this. I made a personal decision to not have kids because I don't have a future to offer them. I don't think we are going to win this battle. I think we are really done. The last thing uh, uh, before we leave the Amazon is I need to mention, uh, I want to read 
a short bit from a conversation I had with Dr. Lovejoy. Um, the, it, the Amazon and tropical rainforests around the world are already so degraded that instead of absorbing emissions, they're now releasing more carbon annually than all of the traffic in the United States. In 2010, the Amazon drought released as much CO2 as the total annual emissions of Russia and China combined. There's 1.5 acres of rainforest lost every second. At some point in the not so distant future, the Amazon will regularly emit more carbon than it absorbs. Yet another critical tipping point for Earth. So Dr. Lovejoy, um, like I said before, he's very measured, quiet, um, stoic at times, and um, he wouldn't talk a whole lot. He, he chose his words sparingly, and um, there was only one time of all the days in there that we were together that I saw him really express strong emotion. And I was sat down with him. It was, it was during this interview that I'm going to read you this page from. And he had penned an op-ed for the New York Times a, a long time ago. I mean, it was, I think, almost 20 years ago, warning that uh, we needed to keep Earth's temperature from not going above, I think it was 1C at the time. We're at uh, 1.2 now. And he... Uh, so he, you know, we were talking about that, and I started talking about these other studies and projections, talking about well, what happens when we go to 2C, 3C, 4C. And I think it was right around 4C, he slammed his hand on the table and he said, people have no idea what's going to happen when we hit 2C. There are reasons other than moral concerns for protecting the Amazon, including self-interest. We go to the doctor and the pharmacy and we have no clue where our drugs came from, Lovejoy says. More of that is from nature than we realize. Lovejoy mentions a poison found in the Amazon that led to the product, pr production of the pharmaceutical captopril, which in turn became one of the first ACE inhibitors and is now used by hundreds of millions of people to control their blood pressure and heart conditions. Captopril widens blood vessels, making it easier for the heart to pump blood through them. Most of the people taking it have no idea that this drug responsible for their health is from the Amazon. He mentions another example, a vine found by indigenous people there. When they threw it in a lake, all the fish came up to the surface gasping for air, which made their fishing much easier. The name of the substance that causes this is curare, it is used today as a muscle relaxant during major abdominal surgeries. His point is that if we continue to destroy the Amazon at our current pace, we may never know how it could help save millions or possibly billions of human lives in the future. Lovejoy believes that this is one of the least appreciated aspects of biodiversity. The Amazon is a gigantic library of the life sciences which is continually acquiring new volumes, he says. We are discovering new species of birds all the time. And wrapped up in all of that is incredible adaptation capacity. It's important to remember each species represents a set, of con a set of solutions to a set of biological problems. And any one of those can turn out to revolutionize how we understand biological science. Lovejoy pauses and gazes admiringly at the jungle surrounding the camp, then turns back to me. We are so stuck on ourselves. We don't think we need any of it, he says. We think we are some godlike thing. It's now far too late to avert global environmental catastrophe. 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded with the only warmer years being 2015, 2016, and 2017. We're currently in the middle of what is on track to be the warmest decade ever. We are in the sixth mass extinction event that industrial civilization has caused. We're injecting CO2 in the atmosphere at a rate 10 times faster than what occurred during the Permian mass extinction event 252 million years ago that annihilated 90% of life on Earth. 
Our current extinction rate is 1,000 times faster than normal, and it is faster than that of the Permian mass extinction. But today, similar to what I experienced reporting from Iraq, people don't want to know how deep the truth goes. The business as usual economic paradigm continues, and there's nothing to indicate that this is going to change in the radical way necessary to even bring about some mitigation. But the denialism is not just on the right, it's not just fossil fueled. On the left, we have plenty of our own iterations. Last fall, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a report saying we had 12 years to avert global climate catastrophe. There was nothing new in that report. And in fact, last week, a study came out by several universities showing that the IPCC consistently soft-selled the crisis that's upon us. Uh, this on top of us knowing for a long time, and this coming from several IPCC authors I interviewed myself, some of them are in this book, who told me off the record that it's heavily politicized, it's lowest common denominator science, i.e. it's not actually scientific process at all, and by the time the assessments come out, which is only every seven years, much of that information in them is at least 10 years old. One, I learned from one IPCC contributor recently who said that you can essentially take the IPCC's worst case projections and double them. But people pretend like we have 12 years still. Then there's the New Green Deal. Again, let's switch everything over within 10 years that we can maintain some iteration of this economic paradigm, jobs, industry, growth, et cetera, et cetera. And let me interject and say I am not being, I am being critical of the sentiment behind these of the idea that there is still time. I am not being disparaging that these things shouldn't happen like the New Green Deal. Anything is good and helpful at this time. But I bring this up to just point out that uh, the idea that we still have time or that we can still somehow maintain this mode of Western industrial civilization is not being honest. Uh, other, other examples of denialism are that somehow the 2020 election, if, if Trump gets booted out of the White House, that that's going to help with the climate crisis. Um, you know, the fact that, that a lot of these projections go to 2100 as though some horrific impacts already, already are not already uh, upon us. Uh, geoengineering, there's going to be some techno fix. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of recent literature recently even saying that there, um, some of the authors are hopeful because there can be some sort of a geoengineering fix to this geoengineering crisis, which is specifically what it is. Uh, all of these, I think, are various forms of denialism that are steeped in not really seeing clearly and honestly what's happening. Because none of these really take into to, to account the fact that we are genuinely off the cliff, and every one of them is an attempt to fix something that's not fixable already. The oceans have absorbed 93% of all the heat that humans have added to the atmosphere to date. To give you an idea of how much energy that is, if they had not done so, our atmospheric temperature right now would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter we'd be well on our way to Venus. Today's carbon dioxide levels at 412 parts per million CO2 are already in accordance with what historically brought about a steady state temperature of 7C higher. We're just waiting for the planet to catch up to the injury that's been done. The oceans are now literally overheating, deoxygenating, and acidifying. Insects are essential for the proper functioning of all of Earth's ecosystems as they are food for other creatures, pollinators, and recyclers of nutrients. Without insects, to put it simply, humans cannot survive. A recent series of studies informs us that at the current trajectory, we're losing 2.4% of their biomass annually. At the current trajectory, assuming there is no acceleration, 
that's a false assumption, but let's just assume there's no acceleration. There will be no insects in 100 years. Since just 1970, 60% of all mammals, fish, birds, and reptiles are gone. What would we call it if there had been a 60% reduction of the entire human population since 1970? The IPCC's worst case temperature scenario is four to five C warming by 2100. The International Energy Agency stated that preserving our current economic paradigm virtually guarantees a six C rise in Earth's average temperature before 2050. Shell and BP analysts expect the globe to be as much as five C, warm, five C warmer than it is now by the middle of the century. I had written an article for Tom Englehart's great website, tomdispatch.com in 2013, uh, titled, Are We, Fa Are we Falling Off the Climate Precipice? Uh, during which time I connected all the dots and really understood how far off the precipice we already were. Um, and even then it was clear, but today, six years later, after having penned that article, a sober reading of all the latest climate change science indicates that we are now virtually in free fall. We're in a nonlinear situ situation of climatic disruptions and their effects. We're locked into a course of uncontrollable levels of climate disruption, bringing starvation, destruction, mass migration, disease, and war. There can be no longer any question that life as we know it is ending. So this feeling in the room right now, after hearing all of that, what do we do with this? How are we going to be going into this, facing the real possibility of our own extinction? I think one of the biggest privileges of writing this book is the people that it brought me into contact with. And one of them was a Native American elder, a Cherokee medicine man named Stan Rushworth. And he reminded me of a very important distinction that has, at least up until today, become a beacon of light for me and something that I hold on to when I am writing my dispatches or giving a talk and come into this feeling of hearing all of that extremely uh, intense information. And he pointed out how a very important distinction between rights and obligations, that Western colonialist mindset is that we have rights. What are my rights? But in indigenous thinking, they believe that we are born onto the planet with two primary obligations. One, an obligation to serve and be good stewards of and take care of the planet. Excuse me. The second obligation is to make all decisions with the greatest care in order to take care of the future generations of all species. So when I get up each day and look at what can be done I find solace now in orienting myself around what are my obligations and how can I best serve those? How can I best carry those out? So are we not morally obliged now to do everything possible to serve and protect the earth no matter what, no matter how bleak things appear, no matter how intense, challenging, and difficult it's going to become? Czech dissident writer and statesman Václav Havel said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. It is genuinely hard for me to see how humans make it through this, uh, we, but we don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody can make any hard predictions on any of this. But what we do know is that we are in a hospice situation with much of life on Earth, including possibly our own species. 
Yet, like I said, given that we've never been here, we don't know for sure what is going to happen. Hence, again, no matter how bleak it might appear, are we not morally obliged to do everything that we can to be good stewards of the planet and to protect and serve and safeguard future generations of all species? I believe that each one of us has our own calling. I am not here to tell you what to do. I think anyone who tries to tell you they think they know for sure what to do, you should probably not listen to them. Uh, I think that each of our answers have to come from deep inside of ourselves. I, so one of the orienting facts for me that has helped me uh, reaching this point and knowing what's happening to the situation, it actually came from uh, at one of the stories that Stan Rushworth, who I mentioned, shared with me, which is in, in the book, and I want to read it. It's about a page because I want to be very, very specific and accurate about this. It's an old story that was told to him by writer and storyteller, uh, an indigenous elder, Dr. Daryl Babe Wilson, who was born into the Pitt River Nation tribe of Northeastern California. Wilson tells of Mis Misa, a small but powerful spirit that inhabits Akuyet, what white people call Mount Shasta, located in the southern end of the Cascade Range in North Central California. Mis Misa is a spirit force that balances the earth with the universe and the universe with the earth. Wilson says that Akuyet is, quote, the most necessary of all the mountains upon earth, for Mis Misa keeps the earth the proper distance from the sun and keeps everything in its proper place when wonder and power stir the universe with a giant yet invisible canoe paddle. Mis Misa keeps the earth from wandering away from the rest of the universe. It maintains the proper seasons and the proper atmosphere for life to flourish as earth changes seasons on its journey around the sun. The mountain, the story tells us, must be worshipped because Mis Misa dwells deep within it. To climb the mountain with a pure heart and with real resolve and to communicate with, quote, all of the light and all of the darkness of the universe is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa to the heart of the universe. While in this posture, the spirit of man-woman is in perfect balance and harmony. For as long as Mis Misa's instructions are followed with sincerity, society will be maintained. Its inhabitants will survive for the long term. Quote, the most important of all of the lessons, it is said, is to be so quiet in your being that you constantly hear the soft singing of Mis Misa. However, the story also warns that by not listening to Mis Misa's song, the song will fade. Mis Misa will depart and the earth and all of the societies upon earth will be out of balance and the life therein vulnerable to extinction. I always wondered why a guy from Houston, Texas, who made his way up to Alaska just to be in the mountains, why had I always been drawn by the siren song up into these places? And so I met Stan at the very end of working on the manuscript of this book, literally 10 days before the deadline. And he told me this story, and then I knew. I've always gone up into the mountains because that's where I go to listen to the earth. And that's where I go to listen to Mis Misa. And before I conclude, I'd like to read a prayer for the earth written by Stan Rushworth. Let us just see it, simply, enough to drink in spring's radiance, the yellow scotch broom against green fields. Allow our eyes to reach into the morning like fingers into wet grass, our tears falling into April's rain. We've been too long away, and the need is huge, our desire unsteady in this time. Let the invisible wanting burst to the surface of our skin, where we may know this world who holds us so dearly, even in the middle of our blindness and in the beginnings of our awakening. 
Let us lie face down in her beauty, feeling her with our gratitude. She is waiting. And so I want to conclude with leaving you with two questions. Where do you go to listen to Mies Misa? And when was the last time that you went there to listen? Thank you. Are you familiar with the work of Jem Bendel? I am. Because that's what's inspired me the last couple of months. He uses a different word. He uses the word climate tragedy. You know, deep adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy. And he says, I mean, I haven't read it in enough detail to know, but I don't think what he says is very much different from what you've been saying. That's right. So Jim Bindell is uh, doing very important work. He's talking about, he's written a paper called Deep Adaptation that I would highly recommend people download and read uh, because he's talking about the inevitable collapse of Western civilization and that uh, rather than trying to fix what's happening uh, or try to mitigate it, both things, you know, can, can have some value. He talks about adaptation to what is already baked into the system. So... Uh, I definitely would highly recommend reading that. Uh, Dar, it's, uh, as a person that's followed you for a while, it's uh, uh, very uh, pleasing to be, have the opportunity to ask you a question. It seems to me that we are headed into a period in, for wherever a person is on the political spectrum, that in instead of having a choice between something that's good and something that's bad, we're entering into an era where no matter where you are in the spectrum, we're going to be at making a choice between what's bad and what's worse. And I'm concerned that we don't uh, have the uh, ethical or moral philosophy to deal with these issues. And I wonder if this is a topic that you've uh, thought about and what you have to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have like nine minutes left. It's <laughs> um, well, I'll cut to the chase the best I can. Um, it's clear, I mean, this government of this country is egregious in, in, insofar as how could you be having a worse response slash non-response to the crisis. But even in the better countries, if you look at the scope of the crisis and what I shared with you today, tonight, how would governments look if they were actually responding accordingly? Um, you know, it would be full-scale alert. Uh, le let me just use a little a, a, a micro example. So in the sea level rise chapter of the book, I interviewed Dr. Harold Wanless, a leading sea level rise expert at University of Miami, who, again, I'm just going to cut to the chase. He basically said, uh, it appears as though we have 130 feet of sea level rise baked into the system right now. So goodbye, South Florida. Not mm -hmm. parts of it, all of it. So in his perspective, any government, any, any lawmaker that's not ordering full-scale evacuations, the government's funding it, the government's running it, and, and, and decommissioning the Turkey Point nuclear plant that's just south of Miami at six feet elevation. Instead, they're adding another reactor to it right now and not remediating toxic waste zones and relocating museums and archives and hospitals and millions and millions and millions of people and finding different places for them to live on higher ground further up into the country. Any, any politician that's not pushing that is being criminally negligent. And so any government, any government that's not reacting that way to this overall crisis, I think you could say the same thing. So that brings us to, again, it's on us. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do individually, and what can mm -hmm. we do in our own individual communities? And right now, we do have some time here. Mm -hmm. If you're in Paradise, California, you don't. Mm -hmm. If you're in the panhandle of Florida, you don't. But we still have some time here to start working towards adaptation. So how am I going to adapt personally? How can I, in my own little immediate community, start working to adapt, and then, if I'm lucky, get out into the city where I live. I think that's where we're at. And that's something that we can do, and that's something that we have agency over, and that we can all do literally right now. And again, because if I look at the bigger picture, yeah, you might as well just throw your hands up, F it, 
what the hell, you know, but we don't have to do that. We don't have to look at the bigger picture. Again, I come back to that moral obligation in the Vaclav Havel quote is we still can do what we can do. And I'm going to just add in, you know, the student marches, the student walkouts. Mm -hmm. yeah. If yeah. I have to pause every time I just say that because I cry, mm -hmm. because if, if that doesn't wake you up, Mm -hmm. and have you thinking and cooking about what am I going to do if nothing else to support these kids, mm -hmm. then, you know, you need to go to the hospital and get, <laughs> you know, something done with your heart. Um, because that, that is true inspiration. And, mm -hmm. you know, these kids are fearlessly doing what they can to tell the truth and to force the issue. Mm -hmm. So sorry for that tangent, but I just want to make okay. sure I didn't uh, not bring that up tonight. I, um, I understand about no hope, and that, um, but I have to keep working at it. And I run a Citizens Climate Lobby in Seattle, and we have a bipartisan bill in the U.S. House um, to put a price on carbon and um, a dividends that go directly back to the people. Um, and they, we can cut the carbon, according to some of our studies, by 40% in 12 years. And... Um, do you think that's possible? I don't care if it's possible, but we have, we have to try. To that's where I'm at, but yeah. <laughs> you know, I just um, um, am concerned what the right way to go, but you know, this is, I've been doing this for 10 years. I started with three groups. We now have 500 all over the United States, Canada, and internationally, working on the same one idea of putting a price on carbon. So. No, thank you for that work. And I, I think everything counts and everything matters. And, you know, the only thing that is, is, is no good is not doing anything. I mean, I literally think, you know, and, and I think it's easy for people to get bogged down, like, well, I'm not directly involved in, you know, something related to the climate or I'm not, you know, being a hardcore enough activist, but it's, it's easy to forget. But so whatever you do, we need doctors, we need gardeners, we need, we need people doing everything that they do, and it all counts. And, and I think the, the key is for me is, you know, what is my intention and how, how is that taking care of these obligations that we we're born into this world with? So thanks for that. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I really want to thank you for writing your book about the war crimes of the U.S. military in the Middle East. It's a tremendous thing that you did that and all this Thank research you. you're doing. Um, and the moral thing you're talking about. I, uh, I want to ask you what you think about why it is that people are holding back so much because I think that we have a chance if we can look at this on the whole global scale of getting all these scientists together, all these activists, all the kids in the streets and refusing to back down and making this all over the world. I mean, I work with driving out the Trump regime, and hopefully you've heard about refused fascism. Because people here are very quiet. It's, it's not good. I don't know if people look like they're depressed. You know, if you hear what you said just now, it is so heavy. And people have to get together in mass and talk about, in mass, how we're going to get out there. People need, if millions of people get in the streets, it makes a difference. And we have to fight for that. I mean, we've got a fascist as a president. And they really, I mean, we've got these crazy fanatics that want the end times to come that are in the government. They don't give a shit if anybody's going to be here for the kids. And these people are maniacs. But they also want to form a whole different form of rule and destroy the environment. It's all based on, my question is, what do you think of this? Because... So ultimately, the climate and everything's treated like a commodity under capitalism. Well, but I, I, short term, how can we raise a lot of hell and get people out of their passivity? I okay? think that Thank simultaneous you. to this collapse that we're in and going into these dark times, there is <laughs> an enlightenment and there is a revolution happening. And I think the kids yeah. are indicative of that. I think Extinction Rebellion yeah. is indicative of that. And these are two very strong movements that are around the world and growing daily and getting increasingly powerful. And the only thing giving them 
the, de the deserved press owed to them are The Guardian, and I've written about them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pipe up about that. They don't get enough media, but that does not mean that they're not happening. And I think it's, it's worth this point in history where people get to choose what, what side of history do you want to be on here? You know, do you want to be on your feet and go, you know, go forward doing the right thing or not? And it's just that simple. And I think that that level of protest is coming. And I think that it's happening. And again, um, you know, just because the corporate media is not reporting on it doesn't mean it's not happening. Yeah. Oh, thank you, because my life got better from reading your devastating book. Um, and uh, I wanted to recognize there are these beautiful young people in your front row. And your book helped me because it has love every all the way through it, love, actual love with a glacier and love with yeah. a coral reef and love with the people of Iraq. And I wanted to know if you're right here with us and you're here with these beautiful doctors and these beautiful activists and these beautiful young people, um, what do you wanna, what do you want them, especially the, these beautiful young people to know from you right now? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yeah. I am committed to doing everything I can for the rest of my life to help you. And that's why I'm doing this and that's why I'm gonna keep doing this, and then that's why I'm gonna look at whatever it is I'm gonna do next to work towards those obligations, because you are the future generation. And uh, thank you for being here, and I, I would bet that just about everybody in this room feels the same way, that we're, we're, we're with you, and you're not alone. Fabulous. And just ask us for what you need, and every one of us is 100% obliged to give it to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pamela Burton from KBFG Radio, and we do a climate change energy news hour four times a week uh, at 10 a.m. We've covered the wonderful event that the kids put on last Friday, and they also did one in July, zero, um, zero energy um, event. And so I feel like there's a lot of opportunity here. Everybody in this audience is invited to participate at KBFG. Also, there's another one of the low power. These are low power radio stations. It's a whole new way to reach out. Um, yeah, I'm gonna change my name. I heard you uh, with Ralph Nader, and you convinced me to call it Climate Disruption and Energy News. Um, and I'm wondering, as you've been touring the country and talking to a lot of people like me, uh, I know on the progressive radio stations, et cetera. Any new ideas? I mean, hearing about these wonderful people in your book really kept me enthralled. It's the humanity, it's the kids, it's working with others that makes a difference. Any new ideas now as you've made your tour around the country about how you might bring about change? Well, I, interestingly enough, I keep being gravitated towards and, and having younger generations brought into my life to, to work with and to talk with. And so I don't know for sure what that's going to look like yet, but it's going to definitely be oriented around helping future generations. And, and that as well as looking more deeply into um, indigenous uh, ways of responding to this because, um, you know, indigenous populations around the country having survived a genocide um, They've already been through what those of us in the privileged world are now looking at going through. And so I think there's some answers to be found there. But I think right now, especially while I'm on tour for this book, which is going to go on for quite a while yet, um, consistently um, more and more young people are being brought in to my life to talk with and, and sort of confer and dialogue. and. Um, you know, I, I just find ongoing inspiration from, you know, Greta Thunberg's spark and this fire that's now spreading around the globe. And, yeah. and we got to support that. We got to support that and find inspiration from it, you know, because uh, we are all in this together and it would be a great injustice to just like leave it to the younger generations. I mean, this is a we situation. Yeah, hey, uh, I'm 
I'm a teacher from Port Andrews High School where these kids are from. We're going to get back after midnight tonight <laughs> to come see your talk. Uh, we did have a protest on March 15th at our school. We had a number of students right come on. out. I'm bringing students back this Friday to a YMCA environmental symposium here at the UW. But I, my question is on one thing you said, how can these students adapt to this world that they're going to be brought into? Thank can you. you. And thank, thank you for coming, really, you guys. Thank you so much for coming. To adapt, I think, you know, for, for me as an information guy, the first step is we have to know very, very clearly what's going on so that as these things now unfold going forward, you're not on your heels, you know. Um, the first, you know, I, when I was guiding, I had to take a wilderness first responder class. And, you know, we were taught that when, if there's an emergency, there's someone's fall, they're bleeding out, even if it seems like it's urgent, we have to do something right now. Uh, the saying that we were taught to try to adhere to is uh, don't just do something, stand there. Meaning first stop, look what's happening, think about, okay, what, what, what should I do? Because you guys know what's happening. And I think the clarity that I see in folks your generation that, you know, my generation, I had to learn about all this stuff. Y'all were born into it. This is your reality. You get to go, just go straight to that place and so but I do urge you especially at your age take some time go out wherever it is on the earth that you like to really be quiet and appreciate the earth and just listen because you probably already know what you really really want to do and then just go do it like there's no tomorrow you know and then if you need help ask us for it and we'll give it to you I don't hear people talking about this. Uh, would population decrease be a large factor in helping? It's probably too late, but would it? Yeah, that's a, no, pop, overpopulation is a, a, it's the elephant in the room that usually doesn't get talked about, and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, I often forget to bring it up myself, but 7.6 billion people, um, the hard reality, and someone's going to have to ask one more question after this because I'm not going to want to end on this note. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously. Um, so if you look at the, if you take a graph of oil production and consumption, it's basically the hockey stick, and you look at population growth and overlay them, they're the same. So we're coming to the end of the fossil fuel era. Willingly or not, we're coming to the end of it. So population has to decrease. We cannot sustain this number of people on the planet without fossil fuels, without industrial agriculture, without the supply chains that span the globe. So there is going to be a giant decrease in global population. Uh, we have not done it willingly. The planet is going to do it for us. I think that's just simple physics. So uh, it is, uh, I, I know people actively still working on the overpopulation crisis, and it is a crisis. I mean, uh, one of them told me recently that, I think there's six million people in Oregon. Uganda is the same geographical area of Oregon. There's 40 million people. It's projected to be 100 million by 2050. This is not gonna work. So, so that's another thing to just know that is baked into the system and coming, and, and it is. And that's one of the things that Jim Bendell talks about in Deep Adaptation. So overpopulation is a big deal, and you know, consumption and waste and all of these things are a, a critical part of you know, the crisis that I've talked about tonight. And you're gonna save me by asking a better yeah. question. Uh, yeah, we have- Not a better question, <laughs> sorry, you know what I mean. We have time for this last question. Okay. Um, all right, so you've sort of touched on this already, but like every day on the news we hear about, oh, there's, you know, there's a rocket attack in Israel, there's a, there's a bombing in like Chechnya, you know, this city is sinking underwater, um, you know, there's a breakout of this new disease. As with all of these things, how do you feel is like the most effective way, not only like personally, um, but just as a culture, do we fight the cynicism in order to do something? Again, I mean, really, really good question. And, um, you know, for me, daily, I have to, I mean, just before this talk, me and a friend went and found a park down here at the small college up off of Broadway and just stood there and I put my hand on a tree for 15 minutes and listened to some music. I mean, it's that. 
You know, it's, it's moment to moment, and it's a daily thing for me. And whatever I did yesterday may not work today. And it's that, and it's community, and it's, it's having people to talk about this stuff with and process it, because all of us that are really paying attention, if you, every time you open your browser and look at the news every day, you're traumatized. Literally, I mean that. And so, so we have to go through this together and find solace on the planet, and then just like Greta Thunberg has said, action is the antidote to despair. It's find what you're passionate about, where you feel like you can make a contribution and throw everything you have behind it, and then watch what happens. There. <laughs> Thank you.